it's wonderful to see so many folks. This is, um, you know, last semester, uh, we weren't able to do in-person events um, as things changed with the uh, COVID-19 situation. And um, so to be able to come back together uh, for an event that isn't just, um, just USF students and just USF faculty, but to have um, a special guest with us, um, I can think of nobody better than Saeed Jones, who is um, a former San Franciscan, um, one of my great friends and a literary treasure. Um, when I was thinking about um, what all I wanted to say without giving away half of our conversation as well, um, you know, sometimes what you need is the book that's lying right by right beside your bed. And um, the book that happened to be lying right beside my bed is um, uh, a book on East Asian calligraphy, um, how to make various uh, ideograms um, that are used in uh, both Chinese and Japanese writing. And I was looking at the ideogram for plum tree and figuring it out, you know, how it includes the word tree and how it includes the sound for plum. And I turned the page and the next ideogram that I saw was the word for poetry. And poetry is made of two parts. It's made of a part that means word or speech and another part that means held in the heart stored in the heart. So that immediately made me think of Saeed. Um, he is poetry that you hold in your heart. His work is the kind of um, poetry that sits with you, that opens you up, that makes you think deeper about your own life, your own work, and your own experience. And um, Prayud to Bruce, um, his extraordinary debut collection from Coffee House Press, um, really was sort of um, uh, a friendly fire that took place on the landscape of poetry. Um, it won the 2015 Penn Joyce Osterweil Award for Poetry. Um, it was also a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. Um, in addition to being a poet, uh, Saeed has worked as a journalist, as a culture editor, um, he has uh, written in so many various forms and lived such a fascinating and um, richly storied life that um, it was no surprise that he would follow up his first collection of poetry with a memoir. And uh, how we fight for our lives burst onto the time. New York Times bestseller list. Um, it became everybody's favorite memoir of the year. And as someone who reads a lot of memoir and enjoys um, story, what I found so um, compelling about Saeed's work is the way in which he makes you feel like you are present, like you are um, inside the the um, inside the the scene inside the um, inside the action and um, I think one of the things that uh, if any of you follow Saeed on Twitter you know he has practically patented this gesture which started as sort of a practical thing he was working for BuzzFeed and um, editing would say, don't comment 
on anything that we're doing a political story about. And so when Saeed would retweet something and he really wanted to comment on it, um, he would uh, put the phrase, looks directly at camera. So you knew he was having thoughts and he was inviting you to read those thoughts along with him. Um, that's the way I feel in reading his memoir is that we are looking directly at the camera. There are times where he stops and he just, you know, after he has laid out a scene, after he's laid out a story, um, he just looks at us and we know, we get it. We understand what is uh, being experienced. Um, we're gonna start off, Saeed and I are gonna talk because we haven't talked in like a month. <laughs> And um, then uh, we'll have some reading. And please, if you have questions that you want to ask Saeed, just DM them to me on the chat function. And um, when we get to the Q&A portion at the end, I will, um, I will call your name and you can unmute and ask your question. And if you can't unmute, Dave will unmute you. So. Um, Remember, this is our first time doing a, a Zoom event with important guests, and um, I hope we, we do it well. But um, it's my great pleasure to introduce my friend and my shining star, Saeed Jones. Um, oh, my word. Oh, look at this. I love like a Zoom applause. I'm screaming. I love it. Oh, y'all are so beautiful. This is like, hi, Ari. Hi, Susan. Um, this is, this is great. Uh, it's so good We're to talk to you. We're all just in our living rooms. Yeah, I, it's, 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 you know, I, sometimes I have conflicted feelings about the way like the Zoom event has made my home. <laughs> like a part of my professional space. I think I've always, you know, tried to keep a pretty clear boundary between the two. Um, but also, I don't know, I mean, particularly like for an MFA program, it feels like kind of like a neat gesture toward owning the fact that my life as a, as a, just a person um, is of course a part of my art, you know? And, and so like, even just like seeing it feels like a nod toward that. That's like my, my positive spin. <laughs> Oh, and the fact that I have to clean my fucking house all the time. <laughs> Unless you're like me, where your your best Wi-Fi spot is up against the, the light switch. Screaming, screaming. <laughs> I don't even, yeah, that's a good point. I think this is like a good Wi-Fi spot. We will learn together. Well, it's a good <laughs> spot. I love that you have Silence's complicity hanging there over. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, so I mean, maybe that's a good place to start. start. Sure. Um, one of the things that um, writers grapple with all the time is like, how do we go from being silent to being vocal? Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. what were the things that moved you toward writing as uh, a form of self-expression? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I I think as a as a queer kid, as a as an artsy kid, whose um, mother, my mom was always very supportive of me drawing and writing and everything. The rest of my family was absolutely not. Um, uh, I think growing up as a kid in the '90s, um, you know, writing quickly emerged as 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 a safe space. Um, it, it was the one, you know, like, a, you know, as a particularly as a black kid who like could not always just like close my bedroom door whenever I wanted, you know, like my, my bedroom was not necessarily my domain. Um, you know, I, the, the notebook um, and, and, and what I was reading, you know, that, that space, the space of words, uh, of text um, quickly emerged as a space where I could um, sort out my feelings, my yearnings, 
Um, I will admit that, like, I literally, like, just on this bookcase, just over here, I have one of my, my main notebook that I kept, my diary, I guess, in high school, and I, um, I would consult it now and then as I was um, working on the memoir, um, and I noticed that I lie, <laughs> I censor, um, you know, I had sucked a lot of dicks, um, by the time I was a senior in high school, for example. And, you know, I, I look through this notebook and I'm looking at entries that are dated, you know, my like the spring semester of my senior year in high school, when I would still, you know, I, I would date girls. I was still like trying to be what I thought was what I was supposed to be. And um, I, I just think it was so interesting that even in the, the refuge of, of my notebook, I was still kind of developing this code and deceit. Um, so, you know, a lot of the first poems, what eventually I would consider poems I wrote were in persona because I read Margaret Atwood's poem, Siren Song in the 10th grade and I learned what persona was. And so I, you know, a lot of the notebook is written um, like in the voice of like Greek women from mythos writing about the men in their lives. <laughs> You know, like, so, yeah, I, I think in a Let me weird try on way, this mask. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I don't know if it was because I was like, well, you know, one day my mom's going to like walk into my, my, you know, bedroom and pick up this notebook off my desk or what. But like, yeah, I think that this weird back and forth between both feeling safe to examine and talk like and then even the voice like the writing voice is is very high and elevated annoying like you can tell which vocabulary word i had fallen in love with that week you know so it's like very artificial but also there's this like you know very teenage sincerity so this this back and forth between being very candid and learning to use literary devices and art to develop scaffolding I think, to make me feel safe, to make me feel stronger, to make me feel tougher maybe than I was at the time. Um, that was the beginning of my relationship, you know, with writing. And then it's still true. <laughs> you know, like on Twitter, like I, you know, like I, I, I think the way I tweet now is more or less like who I am as a person. But a lot of my persona on Twitter was developed under like trying to feel tougher um, than, than I usually feel. And, and that balance between guarded and unguarded is so mm -hmm. hard to get to, especially when you know that you are prone to having to bury secrets for what, one reason or right. another. Right, yeah. Um, I know in your memoir, you talk about how James Baldwin's work opened you up. Um, were there other writers that you felt were sort of, um, the people who who helped build the steps of the scaffolding for you? Sure. I mean, you know, um, my mom was a very passionate reader. Um, so actually, like, Dean Koontz and um, Sue Crafton, you know, all of those uh, murder mystery books that were, you know, that, like, my mom is... Um, a high school graduate who worked for Delta Airlines, you know, would pick up at the grocery store, like developing the world of those books, um, Stephen King, you know, um, I, in, now I've come to appreciate um, what it means to create a world for people, you know, even if it's like not always like literary, I think that I was always seeing that I was always seeing my mom and I didn't talk about what we were reading, but I saw the comfort. I saw how much she was reading. Um, in contrast to how stressed out she was and tired all the time. And I think so I just came to understand, huh, these, the, it, it, these writers are doing something very powerful, you know, that is, is um, supporting my mother who like can't afford therapy, who cannot afford like healthcare and, you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, and then also, you know, the late 90s were an interesting period, I think, in a lot of Black households in that, particularly in the early 90s, there was a moment when, uh, oh, let's see if I can remember all of them, Gloria Naylor, Toni Morrison, Terry McMillan, and Alice Walker um, were all at the top of the New York Times bestseller list at the same time. Um, and it was, and it's why I'm, I'm always like skeptical of people like everything's changing, like, oh, like, you know, white people care about black people. Because like, there was this moment where like, like, you know, a lot of people who were paying attention to literary writing and fiction, um, 
believed because these four black women were being celebrated, everything was about to change. Anyway, all that's to say, I grew up in a house with like a lot of their books <laughs> and, and an understanding of this like black literary pantheon. So um, though growing up in the suburbs of North Dallas, um, black women in particular, or black people weren't really taught as literary geniuses. Um, at home, I understood that. And, and I found that to be really important. So yeah, I would say that was, and then, and then Baldwin, yeah. So I thought he was ugly. I like, there was like, um, like Giovanni's room, you know, he had like the big picture on the back and I was like, he looks like a fucking frog. Um, but you know, eventually, <laughs> eventually I got into his work. So, you know, so I was an asshole, that's beauty, fine. Sometimes beauty has to reveal itself to you over time. <laughs> right. right? So much, you know, like when you're a kid, or at least I felt as a as a kid who was precocious, you know, there were like only two modes. Like either it was like the glamour of being a writer was what was powerful for me, or it was simply a, a very simplistic um, identification with a character, right? So like in another country, it, the book is so complicated and, and disturbing, you know, but it resonated for me when I was a teenager just because there are interracial relationships. There are men who initially are having sex with women and then having sex with men. And I was like, well, plot twist. Um, because in, you know, 1999, I didn't know anyone who was bisexual and then go back to having sex with women. And I was like, wait a minute, you can do, you know, like it was, you know, so yeah. it, it wasn't even necessary about like the nuances. It was just like, you can do that. So it, I had a very, you know, either like I wanted to be as fabulous as Toni Morrison looked with her bra gray braids, you know, or I was like, huh, they're fucking, that's cool. You know, and, and that was kind of. <laughs> well, and I think one of the one of the great things about um, literary fiction is that you can step into a novel like Go Tell It on the Mountain, and you might not be the son of a preacher who mm -hmm. wants you to be a part of his storefront church. That might not be your world experience at all, and yet you can still relate to the character because of that feeling that they're trying to hide something. And, and right. you know, um, I feel like your, your mention of Sue Grafton and Dean Coots brought me back to my own mother's pile of books because she loved mysteries. And I feel like being gay is like being in a mystery novel. Oh, absolutely. The de I mean, because it, it's deception, right? Yeah. And you, you gotta be both the, the perp and the the detective mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is like you got to figure out your own shit. Yeah, yeah. I feel like so much. I absolutely agree. I, I feel like so much, particularly early on, my initial instincts as a writer were honed by the um, I would call reasonable paranoia <laughs> of of being a black gay teenager in Louisville, Texas. Right, like, what did he mean when he said that? What did she mean when she said that? Does that, is that person, could they be, you know, all of that, you know, which is both about tribal recognition, it's both about yearning and trying to like read between the lines. Does that boy actually have a, he was, he was being really nice to me. Is, is there something else there, you know? Um, and, and then also, you know, being black in, 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 in the suburb I grew up with in, and, and, because I was starting to uh, succeed as a student in language arts, in, in speech and debate, as, as my education you know, continued, um, I moved further and further away from the black and Latino students who were in my school. My school was relatively diverse for the suburb. It was like half people of color, right? But but as I got into like the advanced placement classes, I was increasingly like the only student of color. And so, and, and, and teachers became more difficult. <laughs> so, so it wasn't just like peers, it was also me trying as a young person trying to make sense of now what I regard as like the racism of some of the people who were charged with educating me. So yeah, all of that, just constantly trying to read and, you know, that's critical thinking. <laughs> that's inference, you know, and, and I think uh, 
in in a lot of ways i don't i don't i would never like think that like trauma is great to become an artist but um there is a relationship between trauma and survival and a lot of the skills that we then come to value as artists, you know, and I'm not going to say I'm grateful for it, but I will say it is a part of my life. I think that's a nice way to put it. And, um, yeah. Uh, whenever somebody says of a, of a poem that represents so much living and so much feeling, Oh, I love what you did with that. It's like, well, I, I, I'm, I'm glad that you see that, but you know, it's like I would much rather have not had those experiences necessarily. Right. Right. And there are a lot of experiences in your memoir that are traumatic experiences. Um, the, the difficult relationship with the other boys in the neighborhood and. Right being called names and worrying about whether those names are destiny or whether it's, you know, some yeah. form of um, being brought into the fold. And then you go off to Kentucky, you've got a whole new opportunity there to either step into the person that you okay. feel yourself becoming or to reinvent yourself. Mm -hmm. So. Can we talk a little bit about how how each step on the journey has changed you? Yeah, I mean, I think both in terms of um, the memoir as a narrative journey, but I would also say, you know, just me as as a thirty four year old, you know, continuing to develop as a person. Um, so much of what I see as the overarching kind of story is um, trying on masks and, and, and wearing them, um, often being very good at them, <laughs> very good at it, um, learning to like, and particularly in the book, I think you see, like, I, I became very adept at, I mean, we would call it code switching, I guess, but, you know, like persona switching, you know, it was like, who, which side do you need me to be in this moment, yeah. you know? Um, whether it was like, you know, being with my grandmother in Memphis or being at home with my mom or being in the classroom or being a writer, being a, you know, just da, da, da. And being in um, a sexual relationship. Being okay. in a sexual relationship and a sexual relationship with who, you know, like, what do you, like, you know. Um, and what's I, my role here? What's my role? Yeah. And, and, and what I discovered in writing and what I've discovered in my life is for those of us who are very good at the switching and the different performances, um, there is, you know, I think like a class mobility, opportunities, you know, survival, success, a lot of things become possible as a result of it. But I also think, you know, at least for me, it catches up with you and there's an exhaustion. There's a point, I think, when you begin to go, like, you don't even know who you are anymore. Like, you know, particularly without an audience to, to bounce off of, to reflect of. You know, I think particularly by the time I was like a college student, and you see this in the third part of the memoir, I felt like the moon, you know, like without sunlight, what is the moon? Like, what do we, how do, how do we even anthropomorphize <laughs> that cold rock, you know? Um, and I think, you know, beyond the book, just as a person, as I've become more aware of that tendency and phenomenon that I still have, um, you see it on Twitter all the time, like how quickly I'm code switching and moving between modes. And my mentions are often filled with like white women who love Outlander who are like thrown because they're like, what is going on? I followed you because you have a cute dog. And now you're like, <laughs> talking about sucking Paul Newman's dick and like, what is going on? Actually, that's not a good example because they all want to suck Paul Newman's dick too. They're pretty freaky, but you get it. Um, two, um, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, increasingly in my art and in my life, it's always like trying to figure out how to, 
how to develop a more cohesive, like how can I get to being more of myself, you know? Like even now, you know, with Prelude to Bruise and How We Fight for Our Lives, which are both books I, I still deeply believe in and, and I love, um, I, I am struck by, you know, readers who DM me on Instagram or Twitter or just, you know, talk to me and, and they just talk about how much the books made them cry. Um, <laughs> it usually seems like people are DMing me right as they finish the memoir, which I think is a horrible idea. Um, <laughs> as someone who like recently re read the last chapter and I was like, oh my God, you know, I was a mess. Uh, but you know, just like, just so, people are just like, oh, it's so sad and it was heartbreaking and everything. And I'm always like, oh, that's interesting. You know, like the humor, the, the color, the color I think that I associate with so much of myself still isn't quite manifesting in my writing. So I feel like that's still something I am working on figuring out how to honor my work. Well, and also writing is a kind of dislocation because mm. you're doing it to, you know, send this thing out of your body into a space yeah. where you can reckon with it. And, you know, um, readers aren't encountering you in real time. They're encountering right. you after you've had. Right. But don't you want them to? Like, I, I always feel, like I want a sense of the real time in my work, but it's yeah, impossible. But then you have to contend with them saying, oh my God, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> True, and the answer is no, of course yeah. not, but yeah. Is anyone, is anyone okay? <laughs> oh. Um, we want you to read some from the memoir for sure. Okay. And um, yeah. uh, is there a, a passage that... Um... Let me grab it. Um, is there something you want me to read from the memoir? Is there something? I don't know. Well, um, uh... <laughs> yeah, it depends on, on how deep you want to go. I mean... Um... <laughs> There are certainly portions that are my favorites, um, like your whole situation with your bullet. I actually, the, the you know, I was uh, just rereading um, Essex Hemphill's essay, um, Miss Emily's grandson, Malt Hush's Mouth, mm. where he talks about his own relationship with his grandmother, and when mm. he visits her and gives her a copy of his book. Mm. And so, like, if you wanted to read uh, about your relationship with your grandmother, I, I want you to choose whatever you do. Yeah, let me, that's interesting. I mean, it's a, I, the Memphis 1999 chapter, I like, I read once, I think on book tour, and I was like, well, I will never do that again. Oh, okay. Um, but let me see, there is... Oh no, I'm doing that thing where the writer is like flipping through the book, trying to, here it is. Um, just, it's just like a short. So um, it's from the last chapter of the book, spoiler, um, we fight for our lives. Um, I am alive at the end of the book. Um, I make it. Um, my mother, unfortunately, does not. My mother, um, and, 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 and it's, uh, you know, I just say it's something that's been on my mind so much um, throughout the pandemic because my mother um, worked uh, as a gate agent uh, for Delta Airlines. She worked for Delta, like, you know, my whole life um, in, in different iterations, but she was working as a gate agent uh, at the Atlanta Hartsfield Airport um, when she died. And um, my mom had just, you know, just a very working class relationship to healthcare and, and had a lifelong heart condition that eventually killed her. And um, so as soon as the pandemic, you know, as we started to learn what COVID is and what it does, um, I, I, I it, it's a weird thing to say, but, um, you know, so often I miss my mom and wish she was here. And the pandemic was frankly the first time where I was like, I'm so glad she's not here. I'm so glad she is not here because I really feel that if my mom was alive now, she would get, she would have died of COVID. Um, and, and the circumstances would have been, you know, even worse than they were. So that's been on my mind um, just a lot. But 
anyway, um, this is uh, the last chapter of the book and it's after my mom passed away and I had a really, you know, complicated relationship with my grandmother who has also passed away in the last few months, not of COVID. Um, um, but uh, a few months after my mom passed away, my grandmother and I had a phone call um, where, particularly for her as, you know, a pretty tight-lipped uh, Black Christian Southern woman who's not a storyteller, who was not very emotive, who would not, you know, vulnerability was not something she could easily access. She just like opened up and it just felt like a break in the clouds for a moment. Yeah. Um, so I'm on the beach in Spain, as you do, um, with um, a, a friend named Esther. If you've read the book, you, you get the tea on Esther. As Esther played with the sand next to her, combing it with her wrinkled fingers, I thought about my grandmother, who must have been just a few years older than Esther. My grandmother had never been to Europe. I couldn't remember the last time I had chatted with her as easily as I did with Esther. My grandmother and I didn't chat. That was never our relationship, but we had, in the months after my mom died, started calling each other again. The calls were short, and we rarely have ever talked about mom, yet her presence was always there somehow. Early in the summer, I was calling from my new apartment in Harlem, and just as we reached the lull in the conversation that usually precipitated us ending the call, my grandmother let out a heavy sigh. I sure do miss that woman, she said. It's difficult to describe the warmth I felt in her voice right then. I could hear my grandmother smiling on the other end of the line, an image of her daughter formed in her mind, Carol Jean smiling in the sunlight, sunglasses on, hair shimmering. That woman. I heard my grandmother's joy build, and I heard grief come back to snatch her smile away. Good memories had become self-inflicted cruelties for us. It knocked the wind out of me. I hunched my shoulders and nodded, unable to answer her back. I'd heard so many people speak lovingly of my mother since she died, but no sentence had as much love tucked into it as my grandmother's. I sure do miss that woman. For the first time in years, I wished I could hug, really hug, my grandmother. I wished mom could have heard the love in her mother's voice just then. That was that was such a good passage to read. Thank you. Um, yeah, I wish you could have heard that love in her own mother's voice. It's um, hindsight, the mm -hmm. hindsight of losing someone. You know, when when you realize they're really gone, and what you want to say um, is really to be spoken to someone else. Um, I, I love how much it reveals about her and her humanity because she's sort of a hard woman in the beginning of the book. <laughs> she's a really, I mean, you know, I, I, I love difficult women as characters, um, perhaps quite obviously because I was raised by a few. Um, but, you know, I, I'm one of the things I'm proud of in the book, I think, is um, that I felt that I was able to honor not just my mother's complexity, um, but but my grandmother's complexity. Um, and, and, and so that that moment's really important, I think, you know, to to show um, that even, you know, the, the pain, the, the trauma that our loved ones inflict or have inflicted on us and vice versa, right? Like there can still be these moments where that is contradicted and, right. you know. And, and that the motives might be very mixed up. Like they're mm -hmm. inflicting mm -hmm. pain upon you yeah. with this idea that it's for your own good. And of right. course, you know, for my own good was never a good excuse to me. Right, I'm like, exactly. 
please don't go through all these pains on my account. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, you know, I think as a, and it was something that actually my editor, Jonathan Cox, um, helped me um, come to embrace in writing the memoir. Um, to embrace these these moments of of contradiction that actually that's those are the moments that then become really powerful in the you know I think for readers yeah. um, but as I was writing the book earlier on I would shy away from them because it felt like I was disrupting the logic I'd worked the narrative logic I worked so hard to create like those those happy moments with your grandma you know or whatever and it was like oh no like that is actually you know, or, you know, with my mom, like moments of deep pain and brutality and meanness, you know, even though for most of the book, you're seeing us love each other so warmly, you know, that that contradiction is is really rich and human and, um, and important to honor. And just, you know, I think strategically, because I'm a pretty strategic writer, um, it, they build a, a, or reiterate a lot of trust in your relationship with the reader because I think they're going okay all right so you you know you're not totally rosy-eyed or totally idolizing or totally villainizing you know this character you're making space for their humanity yeah. and no one wants to read Dorothy Hamill's memoir they want to read Etta James right <laughs> <laughs> I just, oh God, I love you, Doug, so much. <laughs> Only you would invoke Dorothy Hamill. Like, what? What a Having moment. actually read the memoir myself, let me tell you. Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I, so here's, here's the question, I think, for a lot of our students, you know, we're an interesting program in that people come in to study a genre, but they often are writers who write in one, more than one form, more than one style, more than one media. And so we, we encourage people to take classes in other genres. Um, how, how is it um, to um, have success as a poet, this wonderful debut collection, and then to sort of step away from that, because you had to do a little bit of like self-discipline. Sure. Um, can you talk about um, how you got back to poetry or, you know, where you are now? Yeah, I mean, um, I would say, I mean, frankly, I think it can often feel very lonely, um, you know, because I think when you are working in different disciplines or constantly working in different like sometimes i wonder will i ever actually publish another poetry collection is actually an honest question i have you know like i spent today like working on like something for a tv show you know like um and then meanwhile you know you inevitably are watching other people you love and adore who are like two or three books into whatever genre and i think sometimes i just feel like oh no you know um i think well, and your best friend has like a children's book, right. a nonfiction <laughs> book about tattoos. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. you're both polymaths, and you're right. both yeah. Yeah, and, 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 and that's important. I think that's ground. I also feel like, you know, on good days, I feel like it's also like maybe generational in, in the way that, you know, people my parents age and older, you know, had one career and then you worked one type of job. And, you know, my mom worked for Delta for 30, 40 years and whatever. And, you know, I think if you're, 35 or younger, I think we come to understand that you're, we're just gonna have a lot of different jobs and you know, you, you hope to develop a mission, but baby, you are certainly not gonna work at one company for several decades and get a pension and call it a day. You know, I think there is an understanding of fluidity as um, perhaps just an aspect of late capitalism. Um, for poetry, I think what it has meant in terms of getting back to poetry or when poetry like resurfaces as something that I like wake up and I'm like, I'm gonna work on a poem today, is that I think I just feel like I have a more um, urgent relationship to image and lyric when I write a poem. If it can be something else, if it can be an essay, if it can be something for a character on a TV show, if it can be a short story, if it can be, you know what I mean? I would rather it be those other things. 
but I, I, I think when I feel that the poem is, is the, the only home that ghost can live in, <laughs> you know, like that's the, <laughs> that's where the poem happens. The only home that ghost can live in. You yeah. know, because, because I, you know, all of these different forms have norms, um, expectations, you know, if I, you know, um, write a piece for GQ, um, you know, the editors there that I work with understandably go, okay, well, wait a minute, like this little flourish here is a little, like you're, you're going somewhere and it's cool and all, but like, Stop <laughs> with the this, it is. Yeah, it's not going to make sense for the reader, you know, and so I think I just, I've, I've learned you know, these last few years that um, when, and, and it's hard, I mean, it, you know, it's not like I'm like, oh, I know exactly what's happening, but I think in retrospect, when I look at the poems that I'm writing that I love, I can't see them being adapted to another form. You know what I mean? Um, and I like that. I'm cool with it. Um, it means that I don't write poems as frequently, of course. Um, but, you know, as someone like one of my mentors as well as like P Patricia Smith, who, you know, it's just like constantly writing. And, and I just remember her, her saying at one point that she was like, you know, I feel she was speaking for herself, but she was like, I feel like when I have writer's block, it's because I'm trying to make something a poem when maybe it doesn't need to be a poem. Like maybe it needs to be a short story. Maybe it needs to be a, you know, whatever. Maybe it needs to be a sonnet as opposed to, a, you know what I mean? And, and so that's something that has resonated with me and... Um, and I guess always I'm trying to, and you're, you, you're certainly been a friend and mentor who's been very compassionate about this, like trying to be more compassionate to myself, um, in the meantime, in, in the in-between of, of figuring all of that out, because you don't I, it can, a poet because you're not writing a poem. Exactly. Exactly. Though we can feel that way, you know, and, and that's, uh, that's capitalism talking to us, but, you know, <laughs> Right. Uh, yeah. The productivity model. Mm -hmm. um, that said, I, I know recently there has been a little bit of productivity on the poetry side. Yeah. And um, I would love for you to read some of the new poems. Uh, sure. One sure. or two, whatever you feel like. Yeah, let's see. Hmm. Um... I mean, I guess uh, I'll read three poems. Um, something like three. Um, I, I, I've been interested in, uh, I mean, I'm always interested in cruelty, but I, I, I'm, I'm interested in, um, I think, grief as, as a collective experience like what, what, you know, I think history is a kind of grief. What does it mean to grieve a culture, uh, a, a type of life, a civilization in particular, right? A normal, um, when it is uh, predicated on cruelty, right? Which is, it, it's inherent, you know, however we want to define, you know, just as an example, like life, you know, in January of 2019, uh, cruelty made that normal possible. And as someone who once a week screams out like, I miss the club, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> I miss the club, you know, like I, I do have to remind myself, right? That like cruelty made that kind of normal possible. And my grief is sincere, but like, you know, there, there's, there's some trouble in that water. Um, and so I'll read, um, I'll read a, yeah, I'll read three poems that are, are kind of about that in, in very different ways. Um, the first one I will say is, um, it's inspired by it's a real scientist, a real robot um, in Japan. And at one point the scientist uh, speaks, he makes an announcement and, and what he said is actually a, a quote from, from a press conference he did. Um, this is from like a few years ago. And you know, I like writing poems about boys. Uh, bedtime stories for boys who can't sleep. Phase one. 
In a bright room, a scientist builds himself a robot, a boy, and names him Affetto, affection in Italian. The boy's black eyes squint into a sweet blink whenever the man who made him makes him smile. This story is about how we create what we think we need. A child who smiles as if to say, I didn't know joy before I knew you. And you are all I know. Phase two. Sleepy and blue lit in your dark, you read an article about little Afeto. In the photo on your phone, the boy whose name means a gentle fondness or liking. It's just a lifelike head on a table, connected by wires to computers that make him blink and smile whenever he is affected by the man who made him. You wonder if his father, I mean, <laughs> the scientist, remembers Afeto's smile just means, isn't this what you wanted? Phase three. The scientist tells a reporter, here in Japan, we believe all objects have a soul. So a metal robot is no different from a human. He poses for pictures next to the head on the table, then proudly announces, it's time to teach Afeto how to suffer. The boy is gifted hands of his own so he can learn what it's like to be touched, to be held, to be pinched, 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 pinched. The boy winces and the scientist smiles. Afeto, this is what I wanted. Phase four. Why haven't you fallen asleep yet? Do boys like you even know how to sleep? You aren't even trying. Selfish. You just sit there in your dark, tugging stories from me. Greedy. Ungrateful. If you had an off button, I'd name you off. If you had a cord, I'd pull the plug. I'm sorry, but it's time you learned how to cry. Loving you makes me so tired. And you are to you to understand what you ask of me every night, blinking in your dark. Um, this next poem, thank you. Um, this next poem uh, I wrote last fall and I published in Tin House. Um, and I remember really enthusiastically sending it to you, Doug, as, as soon as I finished it, um, because it, it did feel like, you know, I, I think you all know, writing- In the middle of the night, I'm waiting for a second <laughs> poem to come through my phone. I mean, I think all writing is like this, but, you know, especially because I was saying, like, poems do feel, like, so specific as an occasion. It does, it, it feels like a victory. It feels like I've gotten to a certain kind of clarity with myself every time I write one. So I was, I was really um, excited. Um, and again, this is, you know, I think a, a type of original sin myth as a poem. Grief number 913. I grieve the boy I killed and the country fashioned out of his blood stains. I grieve that it was so easy. The knife, lazy and confident, invading him. This is what love feels like. I grieve that he believed me. Dumb animal, doe-eyed, ready-made gift. 
just another border outlined in barbed wire and crime scene chalk. I grieved that even then, I already knew I'd do it again, 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 again. I grieve a continent, nations united by the way terror turns me on, the hot instant between thrust and gasp. I want you and I had you, again, 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 I grieved my face onto the covers of history books. I grieved the descendants, dumb animals, dead-eyed, ready-made gifts. This is what love requires. I grieve that they still believe me. And this last poem, um, I wrote, um, still in book tour, so I probably wrote like November of last year, um, in part because I saw, I was at, at the Atlanta airport, um, which is traumatic every goddamn time I fly through it, I won't pretend, um, and the Phoenix airport. Um, but I, I saw this mother and son um, who were rather, you know, it was clear they were just like very, they were very wealthy, like like the son had on like Gucci tennis shoes, you know, whatever. Um, but then like as they turned, I saw that his like really beautifully colored oxblood red hoodie was like a Make American Make America Great Again hoodie. Um, it, it it had to have been like the like Ivanka Trump collection. Like it was it was gorgeous. It was beautifully made. White supremacy fair, you know. It was fabulous. Clan wear for the gods. Um, and so I, I started writing this poem. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, inspired by them, um, but also, and then like the poem goes somewhere that is rooted in history. Um, but the other thing I will just, um, <laughs> where for the gods, um, I love this one. I like the, the chat aspect of Zoom where like the random, like, you know, I'm going to like copy and paste like all the random shit I said. Be like, okay. Um, but uh, this history is not unique to Columbus, Ohio, where I live by any means, but just last week, um, Upper Arlington High School, which is a, a very wealthy high school here in Columbus and a very wealthy you know, part of town, um, they're, they're building a new high school. And they learned um, that uh, the original high school, which was constructed in the 1950s, was built on a black cemetery. Um, they they found you know um, several black graves um, from it's a time like nickel black, literally like nickel boys you know like at the time I was like oh it's like no. and this you know this happens everywhere so um, though I I didn't write that knowing of course that specific history I think it there's something there right that it's like you don't even need to know necessarily to know um, and so in the poem I mentioned like a fic, uh, fictitious um, housing development called Serenity Estates. This is the proxy wars. Somewhere in suburbia, a man-made creek runs black with junk. We choked on then spat, tin can curses and cracked bones from broken homes. We broke down, paved over, and built our shiny, short-lived lives on. All the foxes and coyotes have ghosted our gated, security-guarded imitations of strife. Our dreams gentrify your nightmares, and rumor has it, Serenity Estates used to be a black cemetery. Boo fucking who. We pulled ourselves up by your bootstraps fucked missionary under a nuclear moon to get here and what we've got starts to rot as soon as we get it so i say good riddance name of the game america is american for wreck and repeat this song isn't comfort it's just to help me sleep at least this misery is mine I sing in my loaned and lonely dark. And in the poplar tree outside my window, a mockingbird 
sings my song back to me. So I get out of bed, pick up my perfect pink pistol, and shoot it dead. Thank you. <laughs> I love My it. little, like, my trio of poems from the colonizers. <laughs> and you kill the mockingbird. We, you, you read this when we, when he, when we were at uh, the Ten House. Um, we weren't at when we were, you know. We were, you know. Yeah. Um, God, Scary. I love hearing these poems. Um, we have time for uh, a couple of quick questions. Um, Taya, are you in the house? Um, and Dave, can you unmute her if you can? Uh, I, can't unmute anybody. I can't unmute anybody, but they can unmute themselves now. Oh. I've changed the settings. Taya, can you unmute? Um, all right, Randy, you have a question. We'll come back to Taya. Yes, I just wanted to say thank you, Saeed, for coming to USF to read. This was really fantastic. And I really loved your poems and um, your reading of your memoir. And my question is, um, what um, is the happiest literary moment in your life and the saddest? <laughs> um, uh, I mean, ooh, I don't know. Um, I think, I mean, I, 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 do, I think the saddest, um, uh, was probably, uh, I think it was hmm, 2017, I think, um, is when I uh, was, it started working on the chapter of the book where my mom has her fatal heart attack and ends up in the hospital. And um, I, I knew that chapter was coming, you know, it was on its way, but um, I sat down to write um, one September weekend. Um, and I remember it was like uh, Solange's A Seat at the Table had just come out. Um, and so I was listening to Cranes in the Sky on repeat, which I you know, don't rec recommend necessarily if you're writing you know, about trauma. Um, but I was doing that, listened to it on repeat and I kind of, you know, finished a chapter and, and then it was, just naturally time to start the next chapter. And I realized what it was, what it needed to be. And um, it was the only time really in my writing career, but certainly in the process of writing the book that I, I was just crying. I could not stop. I, you know, I, I, you know, I don't know if I, I don't know if I got so much as a paragraph down that day, you know, I was just really overwhelmed. So I just think, you know, it's sad to me in that, um, we have to take care of ourselves while doing this work. You know, I believe in going there. I believe in, in, in writing about clearly difficult, dark, barbed moments, people and voices, but we have to have compassion and emotional intelligence for how we take care of ourselves as human beings doing this work. And I did not that day you know, and it just was really hard. So that's what makes me sad, you know, that I just kind of like put myself on a roller coaster ride without buckling myself in, you know, and it, and it was just like, like, I do that to yourself, you know. Um, I think happy, I don't know. Um, I mean, there, there's so, it, mm, I think, you know, I'll say winning the Kirkus Prize <laughs> winning the Kirkus Prize last year was pretty fucking happy. Um, I will say, you know, there's, you know, I think being an artist uh, and, and certainly like like a, a writer who spent so much time in, in a newsroom, which is to say to develop that like healthy, intense skepticism that is necessary for journalism. I think as a poet, it was like, oh, this is a nice counterbalance to how I usually live. I think, you know, good news or the possibility of good news in the case of like, I've been, I'm a finalist, will I get this thing, you know, is terrifying. <laughs> 
and you know, it could be really scary. And you know, I, I just remember being in the room in Austin at the ceremony and trying to be present and grateful and just like thrilled for this, like, cause I mean, really just like they, they said at one point that it's like literally more likely that you'll be struck by lightning then 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 you'll end up being like a finalist for the Kirkus prize so i was already like struck by lightning struck by lightning like we're good we're good you know but of course there's that like part of you that is like but what if the ceiling is a little higher than i've set it for myself and and the moment they said my name and i could and i don't even think i heard my name just hearing like sa <laughs> <laughs> and and the room, you know, erupt in joy. I mean, it's it's just a tremendous feeling um, to kind of step into a dream uh, that you often are scared to dream. Like that's 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 wonderful, you know. And I think more so than an award itself, that experience of going, well, I, I was happy to be here. I, I, was, I could live here. And then, you know, the world said, oh, bitch, you might be here. You just might, you know what I mean? Like that's empowering. And I, I, I tried to bring that to all of my work. Like when we're always like facing the terror of the blank page, I think that's what we're facing, right? Just going like, uh, how do I, you know? And so that was a happy moment. Yeah. How, how do I, how do I um, deal with my um, worry and how do I deal with success? Those are mm. important questions because- And it never gets easier, I should say. Like it's- <laughs> um, we, We've got a break soon, but um, we've got time for one more quick question from Evan Evans. Evan? Hello. <laughs> I say thank you, your, your poetry. I, I'm glad I'm sitting down listening to your poetry. Wow. Um, my question, and let me pull it up since I wrote it elsewhere. Uh, nope, not that email. <laughs> Aha. Nope, wait. Ah. In these upside down and contentious times, what do you feel is the writer's responsibility or role? Um, I think, I mean, it's, it's certainly different for everyone, but I, I, I think, um, I, I think our role is something of like maintaining balance, like, you know, I think when I write something, certainly, you know, writing about the protests or writing about police brutality, you know, people are reading what I write because they want to hear what Saeed Jones specifically has to say about X topic, right? And so I think that demands um, me doing the life work as a person being grounded in history, in reality, in blood, in empathy, um, and then being willing to kind of step out. Um, and so I, I think that's that balance, like, you know, when, when writers aren't doing the life work, when they're just writing just to write whatever, you know, like, what was it? Was it fucking Lori Moore being like, oh no, I kind of like the way Donald Trump's, and you're like, girl, what? Have you? <laughs> What is happening? Like I, to me, I think that's an example of of talent, of of insight and intelligence that's disconnected from the groundedness, from the ongoing education that we all need to do. So it, it's not just about talent; it's about who you are as a citizen. And and my friend Isaac Fitzgerald, I think, has always been a wonderful um, model of being like a literary citizen. And I think that's that's who we need to be, literary citizens. Thank Amen. you. Amen. Thank you for your question. Saeed, I love you. I love you too. I wanted to say that before I allow people to all <laughs> unmute and scream your name. Oh! And <laughs> applaud because we just have had such a wonderful time having you here. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So good. Thank you. I love it. Thank you all so much. Thank you.
Thank you. All right. Love Thank you. 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 <laughs> I love it. I'll call you when we get off of here. I'll call you. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you all. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.